Whether it's first for a remarkable feat like landing on the moon or the first to die from a disease, history is always fixated on who was first. Whilst most people point to the 1980s as when the AIDS epidemic started, the first AIDS-related death in the United States can actually be argued as happening over 10 years earlier than this. In 1969, St. Louis, Missouri. Even the timeline on HIV.org starts in 1981. But why is this the commonly accepted narrative? It's mostly due to an incredibly small amount of uncertainty and the disturbing nature of the first death, as it involved a 15-year-old boy who most likely didn't get HIV from sharing needles. The narrative for the epidemic seems to be largely not agreed upon. For many years, an individual was falsely and single-handedly blamed. It was the, the whodunit of the century. Patient Zero is the name Dr. Dritz and the medical detectives used to describe this man, the airline steward, to protect his identity. I told him that he was getting other people sick with it, and he said, my right to do whatever I want, my civil right, I do as I please, I've got it, why shouldn't they have it? Gaetan Dugas was a Canadian flight attendant who gained notoriety during the early years of the HIV AIDS epidemic. He was mistakenly identified as patient zero in a 1984 study by Dr. William Darrow. The study traced the sexual contacts of individuals diagnosed with AIDS, and Dugas was labeled patient O, as in the letter O, not the number zero, which later led to the misconception that he was the source of the epidemic. However, subsequent research and genetic analysis of HIV strains have disproven this notion. Dugas was not the origin of the virus in North America. HIV likely entered the United States from Central Africa multiple times. The misidentification of Dugas as patient zero contributed to the stigmatization of HIV AIDS and the false belief that a single individual was responsible for the spread of the virus. In reality, the epidemic had multiple contributing factors and individuals. I'm positive that everyone who is watching knows what HIV is, but for the sake of covering all corners, I will briefly explain what it is. HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, is a virus that attacks the immune system, specifically the CD4 cells, T cells, which help the immune system fight off infections. If left untreated, HIV can lead to the disease AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Unlike some other viruses, the human body cannot get rid of HIV completely. So once someone has HIV, they have it for life. HIV is transmitted through contact with certain body fluids from a person who has HIV. The most common way HIV is transmitted is by drug users, sharing needles or homosexual intercourse but it can be transmitted in different ways too, such as other types of intercourse, mother to child transmission, blood transfusions and organ transplants, occupational exposure, HIV infected breast milk, and any other way that allows affected bodily fluids to enter other people. So, you know, what happened in 1969 that's currently contested? Well, in early 1968, a young 15-year-old African-American named Robert Rayford was living in St. Louis and voluntarily admitted himself to a hospital due to multiple alarming health issues. He experienced weight loss and shortness of breath, and a medical examination revealed an uncommonly severe case of chlamydia that had spread throughout his body, indicating weakened immunity. Further confirming this, his white blood cell count was exceptionally low. He reported enduring these symptoms since 1966. Over the following year, Rayford was in and out of the hospital, progressively worsening until he succumbed to pneumonia on May 15, 1969. Upon autopsy, medical professionals identified lesions on his legs as Kaposi's sarcoma, an unusual cancer mostly observed in elderly Ashkenazi Jewish men at that time. This discovery puzzled researchers initially. However, years later, Kaposi's sarcoma would emerge as a recognized indicator of HIV infection. Rayford had never ventured beyond the Midwestern United States, never underwent a blood transfusion, and had never visited New York, San Francisco, or Los Angeles, cities later central to the AIDS battle. As compelling as the list of symptoms is, it's important to consider the possibility that Rayford wasn't suffering from HIV. With all this known, there are a few questions that remain and are hard to 100% definitively prove. Naturally, HIV testing wasn't a thing at this time, 
but tissue samples were kept allowing for testing at a later date. As the years went on, many tests were conducted to prove whether Rayford was truly infected with HIV, and the outcomes have been inconsistent. In 1984, a test was conducted on tissue samples from Rayford to check for HIV infection, and the result turned out negative, although the specific details of the test are unclear. Subsequently, in 1987, a more sensitive Western blot test was employed on the same samples, revealing HIV antibodies, indicating that Rayford was HIV positive. Rayford tested positive for all nine known HIV antibodies. At this time, the Red Cross tossed blood that was positive for any three of nine. In 1999, it was reported that researchers had identified HIV RNA sequences, but this finding was never formally published or subjected to peer review. Lastly, a microbiologist with an expertise in the new field of chlamydial infections, named Dr. Memory Elvin Lewis, who volunteered to help try to identify the bacteria. On the edge of the truth, an uncontrollable event took place. Sometimes, you just have to wait for technology to catch up, she said. Other times, nature beats us to the punch. As in 2005, Hurricane Katrina destroyed the last of Robert Rayford's samples, making this discrepancy we're looking at today basically unsolvable. But still more questions remain. If Rayford did potentially have the virus, how did he get it? This is where things get rather dark. Rayford informed hospital personnel that his symptoms began after having sexual contact with a girl from his neighborhood. It's noteworthy that he adamantly declined a rectal examination and was characterized by staff as reserved and unresponsive. Multiple articles mention that his autopsy revealed signs of internal scarring on his backside. But I struggled to locate an original source supporting this assertion. Additionally, it's important to acknowledge that deducing sex abuse from an autopsy is a challenging and uncertain process. As he had never undergone a blood transfusion, it is sadly plausible that Rayford acquired HIV through a common route, sexual transmission. There are suggestions that he might have engaged in sex work. Another potentially horrifying theory that seems to be one of the most popular online is that he may have been a victim of sex abuse by someone with HIV. Considering the onset of symptoms at the age of 12 in 1966, it appears unlikely that it resulted from a consensual encounter, and many suggest his grandfather gave it to him. As he said, his grandparents had died the same way. So who was patient zero and when did it enter the United States? We don't know, but the earliest known sample of HIV in humans is from 1959. The identity of patient zero remains unknown. However, if you believe the case of Robert Rayford, we can assume that HIV existed in the US by the mid 1960s. It probably spread quietly and unnoticed until it reached the prominent locations or hotspots of New York City and San Francisco, from there mutating and spreading like wildfire. History is always fixated on who was first. Ultimately, Robert Rayford was a young boy, probably facing abuse of some kind. It's crucial that he's remembered and not overlooked regardless of whether or not he was first. Thanks so much for watching. Please comment first in the comments, even if you're not first, and don't forget to like subscribe and share this video and until next time don't share needles and please use protection wait i mean keep fearing the living